Okay. Um, so again, Aaron Domini, I'm with OHM, um, and I've been the, the project manager for this project over the last several months, working with your community to pull this document together. This is our third public meeting um, as part of this project, and tonight's really kind of the final unveiling of a lot of the work that we've been doing share with you that work and get your feedback. But not only, not only today, but after the meeting as well, and I'll, I'll explain how you can do that um, once we conclude the meeting. So my job tonight is really to be the storyteller, um, to explain to you kind of what this process is about, how the project came together, um, what, what some of the key points are with, within the document. So I'm gonna go ahead and start kind of rolling that out, and then the second half of this meeting is really gonna be about you talking to us, um, around the room, looking at the board, we have comment cards to fill out. Um, as I mentioned just a second ago, there's also forms online you can provide feedback on. Um, and ultimately, this effort has to go to the Planning Commission and through City Council. So um, this, is, this is one of the key informational pieces uh, that we're going to go through. So one of the key pieces uh, to, to the discussion today I'm going to cover is just kind of the process of how this project evolved. Um, and also kind of what a plan is. And then I'll start to dig into um, some of the nuts and bolts of what we learned and how this got put together. So several years ago, you as a community conducted a comprehensive plan. Um, a lot has changed in the world since that last plan was done. And it's good planning, it's good practice to make sure all of your planning and codes are up to date, uh, refresh, reflect current values, um, and market trends. And so your community took the leadership role to start this process and uh, begin to put together a, re a refresh plan. The plan really is a blueprint. It, it looks out 10 to 20 years. It helps the community make informed decisions. Uh, it's just like any time you build anything, whether it's a shed or a house or a hobby car, you have to have some guide on how this thing comes together. And essentially that's what this, this plan really does. It is that blueprint. So in terms of what it is, you know, I think it's really important to reflect on what a comprehensive plan actually is, and I'll explain kind of what it is not. Here are some things that I, I did want to cover as part of that foundation. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting caught up in which computer I'm using, so you're not following. So that, all that talk about blueprint, there is the blueprint. Um, in terms of what it is, it is a set of, of, of policy statements. And it's a map to guide where and how the community can grow into the future. It's supported by a series of maps and tables and their analytical data to support some of the decisions in the document. And then it, it covers the entire land area jurisdiction. So these are some of the key things the Ohio Constitution puts in place and tells us the plan should be uh, when we go through this process. The Ohio Constitution. Yes, we do have one of those. Oh, I know we do. Yeah. And the comprehensive, uh, the comprehensive so here's plan what is I'm required ask. by a Ohio Constitution? Ask. It's not required, but here's okay. what I'm going to ask of the audience. I'm going to give a presentation. Listen, you're misleading people. Yeah. Listen, yeah. If we could go ahead and let the yeah. consultant yeah. go ahead and present, yeah. and then yeah. there will be an opportunity first. for questions yeah. um, yeah. and yeah. Yeah. presentation. So thank you. Some nice ground rules here. Um, should have a long-range outlook. So this is not about making short-term decisions. It is about looking out into the future. And it's generally, it's generally designed to be overly, not overly specific. It's general in nature, okay? We have another document that is very specific in nature, which I'll talk about. And it's guiding, so it's not a regulatory document, which I think is really important to think about, okay? It's a guiding document. Also in terms of what it does, is it does help create a unified vision, a set of goals for the community with implementable actions. So it gets you focused around a common vision and things that, as a community, you want to work towards. It also provides kind of that long-term outlook, outlook for both the public and private sector and how to make land use and development decisions. So from that perspective, really sets the expectation for you as a community in terms of what you're saying you are willing or, willi or not willing to accept within your community. It identifies and steers dollars towards where you'd like to see private investment, how you want to see those things aligned around common goals. Talks about valuable resources, so there's a significant piece in here that outlines where wooded areas are, where wetlands are, where <coughs> waterways are, um, and how you want to respond to where those, those resources are within your community. One of the key things that the plan also does is it helps your community be competitive for funding. So a lot of things like the Ohio Public Works Commissions, uh, the Clean Ohio Fund, 
uh, have grant dollars that are available to communities like you. When you have a plan in place, it makes you exponentially more competitive to receive those dollars because uh, you're competing with all your neighbors. And I think most importantly, it responds to change. So the reason that you update a plan and you keep it current is that things change. It's, this is not intended to be uh, a static document. <coughs> what, it, what is static within your community, which is inflexible and doesn't change uh, easily, is your zoning code, which is not what the comprehensive plan is. The comp comprehensive plan is not your zoning code. So it doesn't dictate um, <coughs> what specific land uses happen today, that's your zoning code, but it does guide you on maybe how land uses could change in the future. So once a comprehensive plan <coughs> is adopted, it doesn't mean that all property rights and land uses change overnight. That, that's a separate process that you have to go through to make those changes. This document guides and informs <laughs> how that should happen if, it, if and when a rezoning is asked for. Right? So that is initiated by a private property owner. It's not rigid, it's intended to be flexible and a guide. Um, and the answer to all city issues and elements, it does not have. This doesn't answer every single question a community has to deal with. Um, and it's not short term in nature. In terms of how it's used, um, the, the plan is used by your planning commission. So when you get development applications uh, for a subdivision or commercial development, well, there's two places that your local leaders can go to make that informed decision. The first is the comprehensive plan. Does it generally comply with the goals and objectives and the vision and the principles that are put into the plan and the future land use map? And the second place that this decision is made is within the zoning code. So those are really the two tests by which you can make informed decision. If you don't have the plan, it makes some of those decisions exponentially more difficult. Um, most importantly, if you get something that is undesirable, you don't have something to look to to say, no, that is not what we want. That's not what we said as a community. It's not who we are. So from that perspective, that document becomes really powerful and really important. It also says what you do want, right? And so it's a great tool for your local leaders to be able to make defensible decisions when change occurs. So is that we're changing it, right? So that's a really important piece for them. Uh, the other thing that uh, it, it does is it informs and guides annexations. So if you as a community decide to grow outward, um, it will inform and guide how those decisions should be made. Uh, rezonings. So if there's a change of land use, it should comply with the comprehensive plan, really. Sets expectations for the private sector. That's a big one. So the private sector is always looking to do development projects, and that's very clear from what you've seen here in your community. I'll show you some of the statistics of the type of growth you've had, but you've seen it. Um, so it says to them, this is what we're willing to accept, this is what we're not willing to accept. Now I've talked about the basis for decision making, and then clearly identifies what is not desired, which I also covered there. So for in order to put this document together, uh, we kind of went through this five phase process, um, preparing for the plan. We looked at the context, the conditions here, uh, what's developable, what's not developable, what natural features you have, uh, roadway connections, the physical makeup of the community. We also look pretty heavily at local trends related to population growth, what's been happening here from population growth perspective. Um, and ultimately that phase two is about filling up a cup of information from which we make a decision. The other cup of information from which we made a decision was uh, engage and listen, which was the community engagement process, which we're still continuing here tonight. Uh, so you kind of have that technical side, which is the context side, then you have the intuitive side, which is the values and the aspirations of the local community. You know, it's not our job as the consultant to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. Our job is really to be the wagon master, to, to guide the process, put information in front of people to make informed decisions. Uh, and we haven't done that alone, and I'll talk about that in a second. Phase four is developing the plan, and phase five is uh, finalizing the plan, setting up for implementation, which is really where we sit now. I know that dotted line says we're in phase four, but we actually are honestly in phase five. Um, in terms of who's involved. So again, us being the wagon master, uh, we rely on a lot of other people to help us get this thing done. First and foremost is uh, we have a steering committee made, made up of folks that live right here in your community, many of them 
are actually here around the room today, and we'd be happy to introduce you to some of them later. Uh, so there was roughly 10 people in that committee, Scott? Seven. Know, seven people, uh, <coughs> and not including, including staff uh, that are your residents that helped us guide <coughs> and make the decisions on this, on this. We also had city staff and officials. There's the planning consultant, us, which is facilitating the process. Um, Could we just stand so that we know who they are? Sure. If you guys want to stand okay? and, and recognize yourself, that would be fine. To our Two steering committee. Hallway. Two in the hallway. Brenda there. Joe, Joe so Flagle. Scott is your, your planner. Um, and so not all of them are here, but we didn't ask them all to be here today. So. I'm going to close this so I stop forgetting which computer I'm moving. Um, so we have the planning consultant here facilitating the process. We talked to key stakeholders. So we were in a number of small groups uh, with other people here in the community, whether they're financial, financial institutions, schools, local property owners. Um, so we had a number of smaller group meetings. And now we also have the community input. So we went online, did a community survey. I'll share those results with you. And three public meetings, including this one. Um, so, a fair amount of engagement is part of the process. So I talked about some of those plan inputs, the existing conditions, and, and then the, um, the community engagement. These are really all the pieces of information that kind of went into creating the plan. So you have that public input, the community survey, the existing conditions analysis we did, and then the other role that we have and we serve um, is to bring best practices to the community to help you understand what other communities are doing, what tools they're using, what decisions they're making, what challenges they've faced, as many of the things that you're facing, other communities have faced. In fact, many of them are around central Ohio right now. So I'm gonna share with you what happened as part of the community engagement process. Uh, by the way, if you haven't seen all of this, um, every presentation we've given is online on the city's website, so if you've been diligent in following this, I'm gonna keep going through some of those slides because uh, they're still very relevant. So we've been trying to reach the community through a variety of ways, through the website, through Facebook, we did mailers, uh, tonight we have road signs up, uh, business cards, the word of mouth thing is always very powerful, especially with homeowners associations. Uh, there's an example of some of, the, some of the propaganda we've been putting out to get people engaged in uh, part of the process. Seriously, Lap, if you could please hold the comments. I'll I'm try, but I'm gonna respect you. Things like respect propaganda, you. it sounds like we're in Germany. <laughs> if that's your interpretation, it's a flyer to get you to come to a public meeting <coughs> so that we can hear your voice, okay? Let's so in terms of the engagement opportunities, here's what, here's what rolled out. We had a farmer's market with 40 people. We had 23 stakeholders at small groups. Uh, so again, those were, those were individuals we talked with, with on a one-on-one -on -one basis. 25 people at the first public meeting, and 895 people took, took the community survey. So it's approximately 6.5% of the, of the city population, which is pretty good uh, when you're talking to that, to that amount of people in the community. So when we talked to people in person, uh, stakeholder engagement, these were some of the issues that they brought up to us that they wanted us to be aware of. Um, so things like the concern for your identity and brand, potential for crime as growth occurs, traffic in the future, uh, the idea that, you know, one of the things I've learned about you guys, and I live right here in Central Ohio, Worthington, um, is that, and I didn't know this, is that you kind of have the tale of two cities as you grew up and you evolved. Um, and so part of the thing that we're heard, we were hearing through that conversation is, you know, where is the center? And do we want to have a center in the community moving forward in the future? Uh, limited housing options, lack of infrastructure to support growth, um, and then some of the other bullet points. I don't, I'm not going to read everything on every slide tonight, but you can follow along. But again, these, this, this presentation will also be online if you want to look at it again. So those were some of the issues in the opportunities bucket. Um, you know, a lot of the things people see as issues, they also see as opportunities, like creating central gathering spaces, uh, attracting visitors through new civic um, agro-tourism and branding, potential to attract businesses, leveraging your, lo your location within the central Ohio region, um, variety of development types and housing types. These are some of the things that came up on the list. <laughs> One of the other things that we, we did with the public was a, map, a mapping exercise. So we asked them, you know, where do you want to grow? And so the old dot on the map, move up here, come up here, tell us where you want to grow. So those blue dots are where people said, 
um, <coughs> where they would like to grow. So it's really the Main Street corridor, Broad Street, Main Street. Very little preference for growth north of Broad Street uh, from those who have participated. So really important, as some of these things come up as I'm presenting them, hopefully you see that these things are starting to start to be reflected in some of the stuff that went into the plan. That's really critical. Um, like where areas to preserve. So these were areas that we asked people to show us that they wanted to see preserved uh, with the red dots. So you can start to see where some of those clusters are as well. One of the other questions in terms of dots that we asked and maps is where is the downtown city center? Where, where should it be? Um, and, and, the, and the survey said that 60% <laughs> see downtown as Old Town or the Old Village, and 18% do not think Pasco really has a downtown. Um, so one of the things that is interesting related to the center is that that's where people gather. That's where stories are told, that's where you come together as a community. And so we started to see this little bit of divergence from the people we were talking to as, as to one, where it was, or two, if you even had one. Uh, so that was something that we explored further as the plan came together. <coughs> so this was your community survey. Uh, almost 900 people took this, which is really, really a, a good number for a community your size. It was open for six weeks. Uh, there are 20 questions. This was open to anybody uh, to go online and take. Average person took about 10 minutes and nine seconds to get to get the survey done. So here are some of the results of that. Uh, <clears throat> first, we always want to know who we're talking to to make sure we're, we're, we understand the audience. So there you can see um, the gender. And I'm going to walk up there and remind myself of that breakdown. 61% female, 37% male. Um, and then the age breakdown is also up there as well. So it's 65 and above is at the top. And then that peak line in the middle there is 35 to 44. Uh, and a nice, a nice participation from 25 to 34, which is oftentimes a demographic who doesn't uh, participate. So pretty pleased in seeing that that spread. 50% uh, currently have children in their in their household, and 92% are homeowners. We also wanted to know where people live. We we learned that that was pretty important early on because learning how the community developed and evolved over time. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had good representation from across the community. So the different quadrants there, one through four, show the percentage breakdown of the 900 people who responded. So that's a pretty good cross-section uh, of people in these different quadrants. 9% do not live in the city limits, but they felt compelled to take the survey. Oftentimes those are people who maybe have relatives here or own property here, or have a business here, but don't live here. So we left it open to them because they, they may have a vested interest as well. One question we asked was if you see yourself in Potassa in the next five years, 92% said yes. And if not, why might you move? Uh, you can see the different choices up there, schools, <coughs> housing choices, family, at top of line there for why people may choose to live. To live. But 92% is a pretty, pretty significant number and people that are going to be here in the next five years. You don't see that everywhere. We also asked that identity question again. If we, if you believe Pat Pascal has a distinct identity, 48% said yes, 52% said no. Um, and then, what do you think it is? So you can see some of the respond what people responded there. It's a small town, rural farming, a lot of things we would expect here. Or what do you think it should be? Some people not sure. Uh, small, family oriented, rural state as it is was a big theme. Uh, that was reaffirmed. I think we thought we would hear that coming into the project, and it was continuously reaffirmed. So some interesting, more interesting questions related to outside of the demographics. How important is each factor for the city to consider over the next 20 years? Right. So that's kind of the horizon we keep looking out at, about 20 years. Um, a balance of conservation and development, and this was on a scale of, of 1 to 5. Um, balance of conservation development. So you can see we broke that down by both the respondents at the public meeting, but also the survey. So a little bit higher, 4.4 being very important to those at the public meeting, a little bit more than the online. Redevelop existing properties was a 3.7. Add new commercial retail and office was 3.4 and 3.9. Create a downtown or city center, 3.4 and 4.2 at the public meeting. So those are how those, those people responded to that. Continue on, we asked about expanding new mixed use. 
uh, didn't seem as important to the folks online at 2.9. Expand new industrial and manufacturing, 2.6 and 3.4. Add new housing, 2.5 and 2.7. And then no growth or development was a 1.8 and a 1.5. So that's these are interesting points, right? Um, especially as you look, and what I, what I want everybody to understand and appreciate is what your steering committee, your presidents, who volunteered their time, had to balance and wrestle with all this information. You know, almost a thousand people here responding to these questions. Um, so some pretty, in my mind, some pretty clear direction kind of coming out of this. Excuse me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait for questions to be there, okay? Okay. How important are the following housing characteristics when thinking about future residential growth and development? So high quality materials, four, strong neighborhood character, four, close to biking and walking, 3.9. Rural lifestyle, 3.8, close to parks, 3.7, and range of housing options for all life stages, 3.3. Uh, Continue on, close to schools is 3.3, independent or assisted living options for, for elderly and aging folks is 3.2. Close to commercial, 3.0. Close to adjacent undeveloped farmland, 2.8, and then add new housing was 2.5. We also want to know a little bit about retail. So we asked a lot about housing because that's a significant part of your makeup and from our perspective, probably maybe where you're going to see most of the pressure as a community from the private sector over the next coming decade. But we also want to know about retail. Uh, so we wanted to rate the type of retail you would like to see. see smaller neighborhood focused retail was the highest at a 3.2, followed by the redevelopment of your existing commercial corridors along Broad. Um, mixed use and then big box retail centers at a 1.7. Okay, so again, pretty pretty strong and clear direction from roughly a thousand people. Of what what was the, what was the desire for the future in terms of growth and development? So we tried to summarize some of that information. <coughs> There's a lot of information in there. Again, if you want to go back and look at all the presentations, you're welcome to. But I don't think anybody wants to stay here till midnight combing through all that. But you're welcome to if you want. So we took the liberty of kind of finding the key findings within all of that. Um, one of the things that started to ring true was this question of identity. Uh, as you continue to, to grow as a community, you know, what is that identity and what does it look like? Balance grows with infrastructure, uh, so growth is not perceived as bad. Quality of life amenities matter. So a lot of those questions we were asking related to housing, and quality of life metrics, so the amenities that people were talking about seem to be meaningful. Conservation is important and desired, especially along North and South corridors. So that was again those the dot exercises where you see people wanted to make sure you preserve their rural character. Downtown core near municipal complex or existing downtown. So when we asked that downtown question, there was a pretty clear cluster of dots of where people <laughs> felt the center was. I think in, in, for a lot of folks, it's the psychological center. I mean, it really is. This tends to be the ge geographic center, and for some, psychological. Desire for mixed-use, walkable center, gathering space. Needs significant change in zoning to align with community aspirations for desired character. So what that means is that in order to protect the rural character, which is what a lot of folks kept telling us was important, and your way of life, and that you're part of your identity, that sprawl development probably isn't the best formula for what you want to be as a community. I think one of the things you're going to see is an underlying theme in the future land use map and the policies and recommendations is that, you know, for the most part, this is not a sprawl plan. It really is. So a couple of things um, related to existing conditions, and we could go on and on and on about this um, as part of this exercise. Um, we, our team was also working with MORPC on Insight 2050, which is the Central Ohio Regional Growth Strategy. And so we had a the pleasure of accessing a lot of that data for as part of that exercise. Some of that we, we're going to present to you and present it to our steering committee. If you read the papers and you're following a lot of what's going on in Columbus, you know, there's good and bad news. Good news is we're carrying the entire load of Ohio in terms of growth. Actually, if you take Central Ohio out of the growth factor for Ohio, we're almost flat. Um, so we're expecting about a million people in Central Ohio by 2030, right? So we're, but that's a, I think, 25% <coughs> growth. When you look at that million people, 
Um, some of the other data that we're, we're kind of pulling out of, the, of that is that between 2010 and 2030, the number of households with children will make up, without children, will make up 87% of that growth. So significant change demographically, and probably not surprising if you watch what's happening with the housing industry, with boomers, with millennials, and lifestyle changes. Uh, the old, you know, two kids, four bedroom, two car garage lifestyle and, and family, that's not who's growing up here and that's not who's really coming here um, for a host of reasons and that's a whole other presentation. Um, same period, 2010 to 2030, 56% of the growth in the number of households in Columbus will come from senior households. Uh, so between 87% being without children, 56% being seniors, a lot of that folks within that million uh, you know, aren't the, aren't the typical household structure that we've known for the last 50 years. So as I'm, as I'm explaining this data and as we presented it to our committee, those folks that acknowledge themselves, um, the data is what it is. The question is, what does that mean for Patasqua? And that was the question we kept asking of the committee and, and we made decisions from. It doesn't mean you have to do anything with it. You can ignore it if you want. Uh, but ultimately, it is impacting this region, so to, to not be aware of it would be, be remiss. 56% of Ohioans would like to live in walkable mixed-use communities. I'm sure you see that if you drive around and see what's getting built. And then less than 20% of Ohioans currently have, have the option. This graph kind of tends to show you know, what's, what's the housing choice metric look like? What are people choosing to live in today? Um, so if you look at the graph on the right, it shows age and a preference for a housing type. So whether it's the large lot tends to peak there in the middle, but attached product and small lots tend to be much more desir desirable at each end of the spectrum, right? And so that's something to be mindful of. I don't think, um, as you see the future plan, the future land use plan that's been rolled out, that this community's been blanketed to accommodate any of that. But I think there has been a, a small nod to, hey, we should be mindful of that, um, of that trend. And there may be that we need to do some other things here locally to allow folks to live here that, that have that housing choice. We also looked at population here, what's been happening um, in Patascala. So you can see your growth rate there um, kind of going up from 2000 all the way to 2016. And of course, the great uh, recession there in 2008 to 2010, what happened, we flatlined. Um, but we were seeing about 500 people a year uh, between 2000 and 2010 moving into the community. Uh, that's actually, we pulled some of that from your building permit data and then just factored in the average household size. And then that slowed down to about 50 people per year. So we also looked at what, what the housing type is here in Patascala. So you kind of see the colors there associated with the housing unit type. And then we looked at your neighbors just to give you some comparison of how your housing structure looks. You know, the, the big yellow color there is single family detached. The other housings tend to be uh, attached or apartment type, type units. So see yourself compared to Heath, Reynoldsburg, Grove Fort, Licking County. Some of the other things we looked at uh, was the housing stock exchange. <coughs> so the median year built here was in 1993. So that's a significantly newer product than if you look at your neighbors, which is 79, 83. Um, so a relatively new housing stock that is unlikely to be de redeveloped in the near term. A lot of other folks are facing very different challenges in this case. We also looked at how many total jobs um, you have here, and then we also looked at kind of where where people are going. Eighty six percent of uh, of folks working out working in Patasqua, uh of the residents here work outside of the city. So that's a significant that's a significant number, and from you know as you grow as a community holistically, that's something that I think the committee wrestled with was how do we balance that? Uh, because ultimately that's where the income tax comes from, uh, which helps with the general fund. So it makes everything here go, and the roads get built, and those water lines, you know, have water in them, and everything's working. So um, that was something that the steering committee felt uh, was important to think about, and they and they did make some gestures to respond to that. Unemployment low, your mean household income sixty nine thousand, which is actually uh, quite higher than your neighbors. Um, so you can see your neighbors there what their median household income is.
We also look at land use. So, you know, how is land currently being used today? This is not zoning. Uh, we have the zoning map here, and I'll show it to you in the presentation. But how is land currently being used? Almost 60% currently um, coded as agricultural. So this is how land gets coded and recorded by the auditor. So this is a magical numbers that we came up with. Um, it's in the GIS systems, and we pulled it to show you kind of how you're structured. 26% being residential, you know, and then that remaining 20% being a variety of uses from vacant at seven percent parks and open space institutional um, you know obviously you guys live here you know you're not a commercially based community and you're telling us from the survey that isn't as important to you as some other things natural features so the other thing that we want to look at in terms of when we're asking the questions of where and how do you grow when we're asking our steering committee to make those decisions it's important for us to understand kind of what's on the ground and what's what's what are those natural features are. So we map tree cover, we map wetlands, streams, and we map floodplains um, and parks and open space. And so you can kind of see where all that property is. And then one of the things we looked at was okay, well, what's developable? So um, backing out that, that those natural areas. And assuming that unless something's really got a structure on it or it's a subdivision, that that person may choose to try to develop that property and over time it could be developed. Not to say that somebody's gonna go develop everything. This is a planning exercise to understand what you have. So developable land was about 8,800 acres. So that's a significant amount of land that is to de be developed. So, so from my perspective, and I do planning all over the Midwest, this is a really interesting formula and an interesting story and I think gives validation to you as a community and your leadership that it's pretty important to have a plan. Uh, because ultimately, most of this that's on the table, whether you wanna develop your property or you don't, um, has the potential to be developed. So having a plan in place will allow you to make some informed decisions on how, when uh, that stuff gets developed. So we also broke that down in terms of what's developable in, in the different land use categories from rural residential um, and a full build out, the developable res residentially zoned land could accommodate another 11,000 residents. So if you did nothing, everything stayed the same and it all got developed, that's another 11,000 people, right? So just filling up the cup with information, telling the story, what is the potential of if and when everything did get developed, if you're built out. Now it's interesting, you know, I'll show you some data here in a second. As you think back at, you're growing at 500 people a year, right? From 2000 to 2010, uh, it's roughly 5,000 people. So the, the pressure for this development that could happen, um, you know, and that 11,000 person number, and you think about 20 years, it's like, okay, if we did nothing, that could be a scenario that happens. In part, you did see that scenario for 10 years as a community. So we looked at some of those growth scenarios, right? So we asked our committee, you know, we're, our job again, bringing information <coughs> to, to the committee, a low growth, really conservative, 100 people per year. Um, again, looking at building permit data, that was that trend line I showed you from the recession to 2016, it was 50 to 100 people um, that were coming in. Um, land was being developed. That was, that was the low end. Uh, the moderate end, we're saying 300 people per year, and then you can see how that population grows up all the way to 2040, up to 26,000, a high growth of 500 people per year. So if you go back to the times in which you were, everything was happening at a faster rate, by 2040, you'd be a community of 26,000 people. So none, none of that, the crystal, the crystal ball is really cloudy, right? I don't have those answers. But I do have the answers related to the trends that you've seen here. And so one of the things we asked our committee is, where do you think you're gonna be? And the committee ultimately said, we think we're probably in that moderate growth. We think we're going to grow a little bit faster than we did coming out of this recession, but we also don't think we're going to be back to 500, right? So again, kind of looking at that low, moderate, high, how many people per year, how many households per year? This is just another way to look at that data, and again, it's all online if you want to look at it. Nothing is behind the curtain, uh, but I do want to keep pace so we can get to listening to you guys. So creating the plan. So that's a, a good look at the tap tapestry of information that we were uncovering along through this journey. From listening to the community, 
to learning about the growth and development patterns here, to understanding what's developable, um, and all that gets kind of put into the mixing bowl. And out of that starts to come the organization and framework of the plan. So your plan has a number of sections in it. It has community profile and the public engagement, so everything we learned is in there. There's a section on community identity, image and brand, downtown, city center. There's a section on land use, which includes things like housing, economy, parks and open space, and the, the future land use map. And then there's a chapter on infrastructure related to roads, um, non-motorized connections, things like that. The way it's organized is that each of those sections has a, has a goal statement, which is the desired outcome expressed in simple terms for that core, that core area has strategies, which are kind of statements of purpose, and then it's supported by a series of actions. So the actions are, what are the things as a community you may do to help achieve that goal? So those things are all on boards over there. You can look at them, they're also online, if you want to dig into them more. So this is why everybody came. I know that, I've done this long <laughs> enough. But I had to go through everything first so that we could tell the story. Um, this is your existing zoning map. So this is how property is <coughs> used today. Uh, and in that zoning code, it has a set of <coughs> conditions and rules of how, what your setback is and how many units you can put on there. And can it be a Walmart or can it, can it be a shed? All of that's in there. And this map kind of drives all that, all of those, all that decision making. Um, so that's what it is today. And then this is the future language map. So one of the things that you may notice is that as I flip back and forth again, existing zoning, the future land use map, there's really not a whole heck of a lot of change in here. Um, there are some things that are different, which I'll point out. And I will take the mic with me because I like to move and point. And I'll go through each one of these districts. Um, this green area is conservation rural. So one of the things that we really worked at, and if you really dig into this and you studied it and you've already done that online, you'll see that whatever that base zoning is, what what this map shows and what those land use types are that are in the plan, uh, pretty much maintain or elevate what can and can't happen on that piece of property. So there aren't any conditions where things are pulled away and said, you don't have any development rights anymore, which I know is a big fear. Um, this yellow color here is conservation suburban, which kind of lines up with the other zoning district I showed you before that you already have on the books. So I want to go back to that. So in your existing zoning, you have agricultural, you have rural residential. Um, so that rural conservation basically mirrors much of that area. Your rural residential and medium low density colors, these two colors, which really makes up a lot of this area. Um, and some of this area down here, um, it's called suburban conservation in the next the next future land use map. So a lot of that starts to line up. And a lot of the colors you see around here tend to stay the same as well. <coughs> I think some of the bigger changes you'll see um, is a little bit of the expansion of kind of this innovation district uh, that we're calling this there's flex industrial and there's innovation. So that's kind of coming up from Edna Parkway, a lot of the stuff you see to the south. Um, one of the key discussions that happened around this was that, you know, as we talk about those jobs, people living here, not working here, creating an imbalance, um, that, hey, we've got to find more places to create revenue. This seemed like an interesting <coughs> place to continue to kind of pull that up, the movement that's been happening there. The other gesture was up here, which is uh, innovation. So as things continue to happen to your north, is there a wonderful opportunity where things come down this way? and you get a logistics center or something like that, uh, that could potentially go there. A lot of the, the bigger changes um, happen in here and here. So this color is neighborhood commercial. So one of the things you were very clear about, I mean, it's almost crystal clear in the survey, was there was not a heavy appetite for big box development um, within the community. But there was an appetite for neighborhood commercial services to support the neighborhoods at a smaller scale. So the, the neighborhood commercial is really designed to be commercial uses that are like less than 20, 30,000 square feet. So that tends to be things like a Walgreens. It tends to be smaller grocery stores, like a Fresh Time grocery store, but not a Myers, 
not a Kroger, not that scale, right? So I'm throwing out labels. It doesn't mean that's uh, that you shop there or that you want that or it will happen, but you, you know the size and scale of those uses. Uh, so they're really intended to serve you know, people here, but not regionally. The other thing that evolved here was kind of this cent central place. Um, so there's a lot of conversation about identity and where's your center and should there be a neighborhood center where you have activity. Um, and then if you did introduce different housing types um, that are smaller, right, that, are, that, are, that do include things like townhomes or smaller lots, that we build that around kind of this core village mixed use center uh, that has public open space, that has you know, more dense living, has retail commercial options, could have office options. The office thing was another big topic that I heard from your stakeholders. Uh, you know, hey, that, I just need 3,000 square feet. I can't find that. I want to have my insurance company here. I'm not Thomas Drift or whatever. You know, so creating uses and places for people to have that office space was another thing that was important that can be integrated into this area. Um, also, good income generating uses to have within the community. Around that, kind of feathering out, is this idea that there's medium density mixed use, so kind of feathers out, transitions out, um, less intense, but still can allow for some of those mix of uses within this within their core here. The other thing that's really clear when you look at this area, <coughs> and you look at this map, your eyes are not bad. Um, everything is intended to be fuzzy. So there are hard lines where it stops at this parcel, goes to that parcel, um, because this map is intended to be flexible. So the purpose and intent behind the map is true, but you know exactly where that thing stops, that's up for interpretation into the future. Um, the core principle, where it is, and the types of uses that we want to see there are, are you know, generally in that space. As you move out this way, um, I guess the best way to describe basically from this point on is business as usual. It is what it is. Um, no dramatic change from how it's zoned really currently or what's there. Um, just it's more of the same. One of the other uh, districts uh, that we kind of thought about pulling down here was that medium density mixed use. So as you kind of come out of the village, is there a potential to kind of do it, and you already have some of that, continue some of that mix of uses coming down 310. You'll notice it stops. So one of the decisions that was made was that, hey, we are really proud of our heritage, our culture, our identity. We don't want to strip commercial out all the way down 310 into 70 and have this stripped out piece of commercial. The idea that there's a transition into Potascala that's less intense as you move through that gateway um, is important to us. And so that's why you see these less, this less intensity in the moving in. <coughs> Same thing to the north and some of your key corridors there. So that was one of the questions I kept getting was, well, why did we stop? Well, and then that, that, that's the answer. Um, so that's basically the foundation of the map. Um, you know, I kind of pointed out some of the bigger changes there. And if you, if you, how many people have been to read this? A couple? Okay. So, you know, I encourage you to do that. We can answer questions up here as you look at these different land use types. Um, most of them mirror what the current zoning is. The big difference here is that um, this district, uh, which is agricultural, mostly mirrors your agricultural district now. It, we're saying that if and when property gets developed there, and you do have development rights if you live in that district to build houses on it, ten, one unit per 10 acres, that the idea would be that that gets clustered and we try to protect more open space as a pen to have just a lot of 10 acre lots all over that space. So that's a pretty foundation, that's a good foundational practice, planning practice that's being implemented all over. Um, and it would, if with, without doing that, the big challenge we have as your wagon master and advising you is, well, how do we balance your, your appetite for your rural character and open spaces and natural areas if everything is two acre, five acre, 10 acre lots, <coughs> and we build out to that 11,000? It's gone. And we've seen, I mean, we can point, I can go around 270 and you can point to where that's happened. Some of it very close to you. And so the intent here is not to give you less development rights, it's to maintain, or in some places increase that right if you go above and beyond that 50%. And again, this doesn't happen tomorrow. It happens if and when the city creates this zoning district and if and when you ask for a rezoning and if and when you develop it. <coughs> but that's the guiding, that's the guiding tenet. 
That's the direction that we're saying in this plan. We want to see we think that development pattern should be that. Um, that's, the, that's the way that we can balance development, personal property rights, and a desire to maintain character. This district um, is very much the same. Uh, conservation suburban. So this aligns with your, your other residential districts that kind of step down from the agricultural district. And the intent here is pretty much the same. A lot of this area you've seen get developed already, right? This is very traditional suburban development. Um, and the idea is that, hey, if and when that, that area that's zoned for that gets developed, the guiding principle would be, we should be able to develop it because that's your right. But we want to integrate and protect common green spaces as part of that, connect them, and start to integrate more of this character. So I, don't have, I don't have a question, but could you say the names of the streets? Sure. We get a thank, you for, <coughs> thank you for that. So you have uh, Summit, basically going up this way, Haven's Corner, and Mink. This is Broad, thank Mink, you. Haven's Corner, Summit. Is that Taylor with all that? Taylor's further on. No, Taylor's okay. left. Okay. Just try to pick out the major ones, otherwise, map gets really cluttered. Yeah. So, medium density residential, um, characterized by development with a range of housing options from single family to detached, medium density, multi family. Again, this, this pretty closely mirrors, this is your existing zoning map, pretty closely mirrors almost exactly what it's already zoned. So, we didn't make any changes or gestures there. The medium density mixed use. Um, so this allows for both residential and neighborhood focused commercial retail, primarily serving the res residents within the surrounding neighborhoods of the city. So again, that's not intended to have big boxes in it. It's intended to be more village oriented development. Okay? Smaller scale, a more mix of <coughs> uses um, in that space. So just some character images of what that could be and the scale of what that development could look like one to three story product. Um, six to 15 units per acre. Correct, yep, yeah. six to 15. Six to 15 units per acre. So again, I will, I'll answer your question. I'll be the, you're gonna be the first one I take your questions on the back. Um, neighborhood commercial, so I talked a lot about that. What's the scale of it? Who's it supposed to serve? Again, one to three stories. Uh, you know, really was trying to drive parking to the side or rear. This is generally, density should be less than 20,000 square feet. Um, so we're pretty low intensity type of commercial use. <coughs> so community commercial, this is the, the low score of 1.7 of the commercial type you said you did not want really, uh, but you already have it. And so we're just mirroring it as part of this plan. So there's your community commercial. That's the big box stuff. Flex Industrial. Um, I think the title really speaks for itself, right? So this is the stuff that you see to yourself and at the Parkway um, that's happening in the, within that within that district. So this is warehousing, could be R&D research type uh, development that gets developed in there. Um, manufacturing, packaging, things of that of that nature. Images, you know, the intent here too is to try to continue that that character and that theme that's being already developed, the level of quality and style, and then innovation. So, you know, in that core area, can we create something uh, that has large scale industrial research, and it also has a little bit more office in it, that kind of anchors the central part of it, uh, proximity, and really taking advantage of the proximity to local, regional, national networks which is why you're seeing some of this stuff develop up to your south. <coughs> so really, again, I know I sound like a broken record, kind of mirroring what you're already seeing to the south, uh, but having that core area of focus be a little bit more um, intense and a little bit more focused on off having office uses. So there's your character images, this is one to two stories. We have some recommendations for setbacks in there, but again, these are recommendations. This is not your zoning code. Uh, so it's really just intended to talk about the character of what it could be. I talked about the village mixed use uh, component. And I, again, a, a catchy title that we came up with, I think really describes it pretty well. Um, characterized by a kind of a vertical or horizontal mix of uses together. 
that has a high uh, degree of public and private realm features. So plazas, you know, the complete street with the sidewalk paver, street trees, you know, water features, things that really organize people and make them want to kind of gather in a space. Um, and it's more neighborhood focused. The whole idea is that this space should be this idea of you know, planner ease, planner term, human scale. So it makes you feel comfortable when you're in the space, not giant buildings with big setbacks. Um, that really is designed to promote more social interaction. So some, some different examples of that, what that could be. Parks and open space, um, we added to this park, public space, park, public and open spaces. So this can include schools, municipal spaces, um, oh, you're green spaces. So one of the other key things, and I've, I've been uh, tipped off that some folks have a great deal of question about the, one of the diagrams and the plans. I wanted to take a minute to talk about them. Um, some of the other key plan elements is the greenways map, the non-motorized map, and then there's the roadways sections. So I think that one that's most interesting to you guys is that greenways map, uh, which is that road map for where and how land should be conserved and or protected in the future. The non-motorized map is, you know, if you're going to make connections with bike lanes or on-road or off-road, you know, what does that network look like? Where should it go? What road should it go on? Um, I will say as a caveat, this was not a non-motorized transportation plan, which is a, can be a very in-depth effort, but we did enough to kind of set the tone for, you know, where we think those things should go, and there's a purpose to them. So the, the Greenways map, uh, that's in the plan is really intended to outline as a general um, graphic of as you develop that uh, rural conservation or suburban conservation district and if you're protecting open spaces the idea would be that you try to do it in a way that's coordinated so you don't have one corner here that has 20 acres and somebody else over there does 50 acres but the intent is that over time, if and when land gets developed, big if and when, <coughs> tomorrow, nobody's coming in putting greenways in, but if and when you choose to develop your land, you sell your land and somebody else does it, that as property gets set aside for conservation, um, for just open space, goes fallow and goes to open space, yeah. that you try to connect those spaces so you create a network. Otherwise, you just were left with a patchwork of, of of spaces, and so these, they're big. They're big lines because we don't know where they go. Um, but the one thing that you'll know on here from a graphic standpoint is when I mapped out where the natural features are from woodlands, wetlands, natural features. They tend to try to follow and connect those spaces. So there is some logic to kind of where we drew the big lines. Um, this is like painting with like the four or six inch paintbrush. We don't we don't really know. Uh, but the intent is. And it gives your planning commission and your local leaders direction to, okay, if you know Tom Jones or Sally Johnson is developing that property, and then I get the next development coming in, I really want to make sure those spaces get coordinated so that we can create that network. So that's really in the intention behind it. <clears throat> so these could be natural corridors. They could have nothing in them. They could just allow, allow for natural migration of, of animals to move through the space. Uh, they could be repairing areas that you maintain, or they could include trails, or they could be a combination of all of those things. That's really up for you guys as a community to determine in the future how you want to program. <coughs> the, the big thing about this is the intent is that you do it in a coordinated way, really. You ask the developer, and that's who it's going to be. It's not going to be the city coming and building this. You know, it's really going to be the private sector dedicating land that you ask them to be mindful of this map. That, hey, as a community, we want to connect places. We want to create opportunities for us as a community to move through space. Um, <coughs> so I don't know if they're trails. I don't know if they're natural areas. But having something coordinated is, it does have a good purpose behind it. So I just kind of put that map back in there because it really does reflect kind of where those lines were drawn and, and why. But they don't have to be there. Um, so different, these are different examples. These are all Central Ohio, by the way. Um, this is actually part of, part of the Rocky Fork here. Uh, this 
uh, example here is down by Spindler Park in Hilliard, where I spent a lot of time chasing my son around the soccer field. There's a trail network there. And you can see how, as that development happened, this was set aside. So what that is now is that's actually a natural system that includes wetlands, water features, trails, people run on it, people walk on it, people bike on it. Uh, there's wildlife in there. Um, I, my dog got sprayed by a skunk in there. So there's a lot going on. Um, and then here's another example. This is actually closer to Dublin. I know you're not Dublin, don't tell me we're not Dublin. I get it. But the point is that it's just an example of when you see that development pattern happen, you know, what does that look like? And why, is, why are people making those decisions to set that property aside? So I thought it was important for you to see some examples here around Central Ohio. Um, you know, this one's actually, I think, closer and newer. Oh, that's the T.G. Evans Trail. That's the one I put in. So you also have in this um, plan uh, a draft kind of citywide bikeway map. Uh, where you want to see bikeways. I know you really can't read that, but it's very clear um, in the PDF online if you want to look at it. Um, again, there's existing bikeways that you already have. There's proposed recreational paths, and there's proposed multi-purpose paths. Um, none of those are running through private property. They all follow rights away in streets. Um, so don't think that you know tomorrow people are going to come build bike lanes everywhere and people are going to be riding bike by your back window as you're drinking coffee. That's not the case. But our taxes will so, build them. So this is the this would be the roadmap. So the purpose here is that if and when if and when you decided as a community you wanted to make non-motorized connections and you do value recreation you do which is what i heard consistently through the plan i can go back to the survey i really don't appreciate the i'm sorry I'm about that. Hey, we 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 our community the objective we'll let talk. Talk. We, let, if we can let the consultant go ahead and finish uh, he, he certainly can, has good information to good. provide this is a plan that was devised by not city council, not the city. This was by residents of the community. Bullshit, BJ. Well, here, let's do this, BJ. Why don't we ask a couple questions? Because I'm happy to. Do. That'd be great. Um, certainly, but when we say this was devised by residents of the community, who, who thinks created this? Who created this? That man right there. No, he did not. <laughs> that company right there. Did. No, I think we have people in here who actually worked on this. Yeah, there's half a dozen of them, but well, that company right like there drove the bus. No, they did not. No, no they Absolutely did not. Absolutely, No, they did not. Are you fooling us? No, no, no. Let, let me let me ask a couple questions. I'm happy to do it because I don't have anything to hide. I mean, at you're the paying day, them to do the job. Do they're giving us I what they want us to say. Do no, they're not at all. They're giving you what the community has said through public input, through public meetings, surveys. We sent a card to every... Well, then let's just file a referendum on it and we'll decide how we, it works. We, we, we sent what's a... Your, what's your first name? Yeah, guys. What's your first name? Mike Fox. Mike, do you have a question about this comment about Frank? Can I take it from... from I, do. I know you, but I wanted to ask it all the time. How does this plan relate to Agenda 21? It has nothing to do with Agenda 21. Absolutely, it does. Everybody meaningful Google questions. Agenda 21. Yeah, this doesn't have anything to do with Agenda 21. To Agenda 21. No. Does anybody else have a question that doesn't think this plan is related to Agenda 21 or anything like that? That because every community <coughs> in Central Ohio has a couple We're not every community. Do you have a question? <coughs> um, it's, it sounds like you said the proposed walking path uh, did not go through private property. Or yeah, the proposed recreational path. Did not go through private property. Yes. Yes. Uh, doesn't it go along the south fork of the Licking River? <coughs> right up through the creek. Right up through the creek. It does door. go through our think, land. I don't it think it goes through some. Only if somebody bought the property and gave permission to. You're talking about the Greenways map? Yeah. Go yeah. back to one slide. Go back one slide. I think it's page 33 slide. on the no, PDF. Yeah. 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 If it's yeah. written, it's going to yeah. affect some people. Yeah. No, Run up 10 minutes. Sorry about that one? No, no, no. The next one for post river. These people will fix up. Yeah, they go. This one, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Proposed recreational path tool. goes through the properties of everyone oh, okay. who lives on sure. Deadly's Mill. Yeah. yeah. I heard a lot of comments about that. Mm -hmm. Again, the idea, like the Greenways map, is that this is, an, and the way a lot of the Greenways around Central Ohio have evolved, they haven't evolved because somebody came in with a bag of money in this alley and put it down so we're building no, it. They evolved because over time, use the mic. as properties develop, yeah, if you could use, yeah. that if you could use the mic. Oh, sorry. Mindful that that connection could be a disconnection. But at the end of the day, 
you know, if we're wrong, which we very well could be, then you tell us and we make an amendment to the, the plan. That's why we're here. I'm sorry, so I don't understand the answer. You said that path does not go through property. Private property, it does. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I did say it corrected. That particular line, the way it's drawn, would be the one. So what again would that mean for the property owners? It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, it means that over time, property. if that property gets developed, the desire could be that you put a multi-purpose path. Why isn't even on there? But if it's written, if you down, don't want it there, it, if you don't want it there, that's there's why a we're series here. of comment cards here. There is an online portal on the city website that's going to be there, and you can tell us that that was But, that but didn't you tell us planning and zoning would time consider time that? that? Sure. So would it be the first time well, that we get to a point and we're in the, it's not perfect? We don't pretend to think that this is perfect. Yes, I think it would be important to, to point out that this, this plan is not done. Yeah. There's a lot of work to be done. I mean, there's a lot of discussions to be had. This is a draft that's been put out there for discussion purposes. Yeah. And while these are ideas that are on the map, they could change. 180 degrees, right? They certainly could. And certainly 900 people gave survey results, yes. eight or seven people were on a committee yeah, who worked with you for six months, and that's not necessarily the end all to be all, right? Correct, that's why okay. we're here. Right, so just, I wanted to get Thank that you. out there and make sure everybody that. knew that this is not <coughs> enough. Yes, so the whole reason we're here is to get that feedback. I, gen I, I could see there are a number of people here who really want to ask questions, which is generally, I don't do that, we keep talking in a group and it's not format when taking some. But there are comment cards here, and the whole point of us being here is so you can tell us things like that, so that we can listen to it, we can deliver that information to your elected officials, and we can amend as appropriate. Yes, ma'am, question? First of all, I wanna say thank you for doing the comprehensive plan because I think it is needed, and I do think that there is a lot of valuable input that you've put into the plan and, and some of the statistics that you've stated I think are very true and correct. Um, I do have a couple of thoughts that I'd like to just share um, and, and a couple of questions around those thoughts because um, when I look at the statistics and we say that there's 6% of the people who took a survey, um, I don't base my home budget on 6% and by Lord, I hope that we're not basing any kind of decision for a community on 6% input and that's very um, passionate about because there needs to be somehow, and I know it's difficult, I know it's difficult to bring people together to talk about things, mm -hmm. but we need more than 6% to really share what we believe in mm -hmm. from a perspective of the community. I've lived here for 49 years. I'm 49 years old, I've lived here my whole life. And um, I do wanna see decisions for the community based on more than just 6%, because like I said, I don't do it for my house. I hope we're not doing that for the city. The second thing is that you used a, um, a national homeowner's perspective. Um, do you have that broken down to Ohio? Because I don't really care what's going on in Florida. I really don't care what's going on in <coughs> California. I don't care what's going on in Wyoming. I only care about what's going on in Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see as a consultant, could you provide us that home that. diagraphic sure. from an Ohio perspective? And most of that data was Ohio-based. Yeah. yeah, so it was a national average, but still, the, it was the slide where you used um, the owners, uh, the homeowners, and the percent, and it was a national it was a national slide that you okay, instead at the top. At it, so there's plenty of Ohio data that we can. So if there's a way to break that problem. down to Ohio, yes. I'd like to maybe see that to see yeah. how we're within our community. Um, and I don't mean that bad. I care about the nation, but I care more yeah. about my local environment. Um, the third thing is that I did want to ask, why did you pick the communities such as Reynoldsburg and Heath and? Um, those few little communities when we really compare more to a Granville or an Alexandria. If you wanted to compare us to maybe a, a possible Gahanna or a New Albany, but you pick some communities on that one slide that are not relevant to kind of Pataskala's makeup. Yeah, and, they, th and those, those <coughs> that we picked, those did, I mean, the committee members can speak up to that didn't really affect our decision. Well, we just tried to put it into you know some context. We picked a couple that are around you, right? But the so context they, we could have picked a lot of different communities. We could have picked Alexandria. We so could have picked New Albany, but that one didn't really. Come. No, and I understand that because I don't compare myself in Patasco. I don't compare us to Reynoldsburg. 
I don't compare us to Whitehall. I don't really compare us to Pickerington. <coughs> Who I say that we identify with mm -hmm. is the Johnstown, mm -hmm. is the Utica, is you know these other areas that are more of an identity relationship through us mm -hmm. to us. Yeah. So I would, <coughs> if there's a way to kind of look at those. Um, they may not be undeveloped or developed as much as maybe Reynoldsburg is, but my my question is, could you <coughs> take some of those other communities yeah. and compare us to? Um, there was also um, the slide that you had for the wetlands, because this is my, this is me, I'm a government employee, um, I work for the Department of Defense, um, and when it comes to spending money, um, I left the corporate world because I felt like I needed to go into government. Um, where the paths are from a perspective of proposed, you know, options yeah. for bikeways. Have you already done the research <coughs> in your proposal to find out what is really an, a real option to build against? Because what I, and I'm asking that very specifically because I live on Heather's Mill and our family property does back up to um, the little river right yeah, there. Yeah. It is pure sand. I've personally had the count or the city out and the county out to kind of look at our land because we have such a flooding problem. So as you're making these proposals, have you already taken into consideration what floods like a Dickens? Because yeah. I don't want to pour tax money into, yeah. and I have trikes. I so just want to tell everybody I have I have two trikes. Okay. <laughs> I love to bike. So the but answer to your question is that we under, we get that those are no the answer is a yes or no have you already taken into consideration what is even a realistic area no we've not done core drilling okay and soil okay that's all i want to know because again this this planning document i'll take a couple more questions then i'm going to break for the open house we're at a hundred thousand feet right no and so i understand if, you, that. if you we're designing a trail there's all kinds of extra work that would go into actually engineering it so again we're we got the paint roller out we don't have the cutting brush out and you know, that's way down the road to actually understand what is the base we need and how it could work. So no, we haven't done some of that detailed work. And I guess I just don't want you to so. make a proposal and put this stuff out there when some of this stuff may not even be developed because it will cost a lot of money. Yeah, so and it would never happen that way. Okay. It would never happen okay. that way. Okay. Uh, and I trust you guys. I really do. I really, really do. There's a lot of work that has to happen. Again, it never happen, it doesn't need to be there. It has a thousand thousand feet up. And maybe it's not. So I'll take maybe a couple more questions specific. I got one from you. Yes, sir. Uh, we went over the uh, bike path a few years ago. You got it turned down. Yep. And now you're bringing it back up again. My you property joins the okay. river. I have like seven, eight acres there are uh, floods from the River River Spring. Yep. And we have to have access to the river to drain our water. All the water from Coyer Road to Hadley Mills Road comes to our property, and it floods every year. So yeah. we, if we're cut off from the river, you've killed our property. So I've heard from a couple people, and I've heard before I even got here, that <laughs> there's not much of an appetite to have a non-motorized trailer connection on Hadley Mills. So anyway. I get, I get, I'm hearing that loud and clear, and I think. Your local leaders are hearing that. Our cows so wouldn't like it either. Any other, oh, no, any any other problem, problem. Uh, uh, Yes, we, we have heard that with that one. Yeah. I'll go back, and we talked about 6% of the community. Every every registered voter in the community was sent a card to take the survey. 6% decided to respond. So are you criticizing them for not? So when we did that, it was an overwhelming support for, for I never got a So are you criticizing people for not doing it, BJ? Now you can take their property or now you can put a walking path on it? I wanted to tell you, say two things. First of all, I'm not criticizing anybody. You certainly just did. No, I said we sent a card to everybody they could take the no. survey. That's not a criticism. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That was critical of everybody that didn't answer the survey. Okay. 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 I don't think that's critical of taking the survey. Second of all, I do. the city, you know, this conception that the city can come in and take property. First of all, the city just can't come and take property. <laughs> We have no desire to come and take property. This is you a have no money, and you might have less money next year. Okay. Okay, that's good. Um, okay. Any other questions outside the trail? Because I've, I've heard a couple times that that's, that's something that's a great concern for people. 
How do you yes, question sir. about the innovation property up in the north uh, <coughs> western <coughs> corner? Um, I understand you're wanting to do that, but knowing what some of those properties are up there, uh, have the property owners up there, do they understand that you're looking at that? Because, I um, mean, there's uh, several farms, there's some brand new great big houses up there that I'm sure, at fact, I think there's maybe three right off of Clark yeah. State Road. I mean, uh, you know, you're you're putting a plan in place when you've got people with some really expensive homes sitting there. So I'm a yeah. little concerned that uh, if that's a dramatic change, have right. you taken that into consideration? Right. We have, and that was, you know, I think there's actually, I, be, I walked in here today with three <coughs> points that I've heard um, from people calling or, you know, sending in comments. Nice. The first was about that SAC 310 gateway and why we stopped there. The second was related to the Headley Mills, which for all intents and purposes, ba based on the, the tone today, and my crystal ball is pretty clear that that will change. Uh, and that was the third one. Um, so originally that made it in there, and our committee worked together, and we thought, well, understanding what's happening in the north, if and when something ever, er, an opportunity ever presented itself, we would acknowledge that that could be an appropriate use there. Mm -hmm. But what, you know, like, again, what's important is that no, nothing, nothing happens tomorrow with any of this where anybody says, oh, okay, now that's all changed. It means if and when you as an owner decide to sell property and somebody else is developing it or you develop it yourself, the city this is the guide to which we want to see it happen. So I did hear that, um, I did hear that, and so that might be another place, place we need to revisit a little bit. I'm going to do one more question, and we'll break the open house, and you guys can ask me questions as long as you want. Yes, yes, sir. A number of years ago, there was talk of an outer, outer belt around Columbus. Yeah. And since your work, you've worked with Morphic, has anything else been ever discussed about that as far as something in our vicinity that might be that? No, I've not heard that in any circle I've been in. In fact, most of it's the opposite. Um, <coughs> that the way we're going to move people is not going to be the way we move people in the past. Uh, so I've not heard anything about that with MC or ODOT or anybody else. So, um, so I took a couple of questions. I'll be happy to talk to you about them. And then there's comment cards up here. I'm going to stand up here. You can ask myself, Alyssa in the back. Let's raise your hand with the right Jeff. Scott, I think most of you know BJ. We'll stay up here. You can ask us questions. You can come closer and look at the maps. You can go online on the city website and download it. Read it Sunday morning over your coffee and really enjoy it. Yeah, um, so the comment cards are over there. That's right. Welcome to fill our comment card. And then tomorrow for Monday, lunch, real quick, because this is important for you guys. This is about you. Oh, yeah. Tomorrow Monday. Thank you, Monday. I think I'm talking about it. Tomorrow Monday, online, we're going to have another portal, just like this comment card, that you can go online and provide more time. So it's up today. Thank you. Um, I was just want to make sure we got that. So here's what happens next to that. So tonight, was, this is the third public meeting. Um, we're going to take more comment tonight, and then the plan has to move through a process to be adopted. So planning commission, city council have to consider it, and along that journey, more things change. So I think we heard some pretty already some pretty clear comments and direction on a couple of things that you guys think should be changed, and then it continues to be massaged. Right. So this is not the end. Thank you for coming earlier. Not the end. Um, we continue to take comments and feedback. Um, and I, I welcome the chance to talk to any of you up here um, personally. If you have questions about how we did this or why it happened and did OHM do it in their back room secretly and bring it to you, no. Um, so I've really worked hard to present a kind of a true story of how this thing evolved and how it can be used here locally. Um, so please, please feel free to get out, move around, look at the boards. Comment cards over there, conversation up front, and thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Yeah. I just haven't read that. Yeah. Yeah. Scott, it was like successful. Yeah. 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 Yeah.